today is the first Sunday after Pentecost, the Feast of the Holy Trinity, Trinity Sunday. And the Trinity Sunday, of course, always suppresses the first Sunday. We'll have Mass the first Sunday tomorrow. And the Epistle for the first for Trinity Sunday, we'll be here again in Denver. <coughs> and the Epistle, the Epistle for Trinity Sunday, is taken St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter eleven. O oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God! How incomprehensible are his judgments, and how unsearchable his ways! For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and recompense that we shall be made unto him? For of him, and by him, and in him, for all things to him be glory forever. Amen. And then the Gospel, taking that according to St. Matthew, chapter 28. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Going therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. For behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. Thus far the word of today's holy God. Today, this first Sunday after Pentecost, in this Feast of the Holy Trinity, we read a fourth psalm, which is not a psalm, but it is the uh, Athanasian Creed, read in the Office of Prime. And in the old days, before the changes of the bravery, in the old days, the priest used to wear, used to read from the today to the first Sunday after Pentecost, until the 24th and final Sunday after Pentecost, the Athanasian Creed. He used to always read this creed, and he would make sure read the, read this creed, the St. Athanasius that he wrote when he was a deacon. And one of the first unfortunate parts of the changes is that this creed is still read, but only today. So we read it on this Trinity Sunday in our holy bravery. But next Sunday, we don't read it. And the following Sunday, we don't read it. And the following Sunday, we don't read it. And so the, the, it very easily is forgotten. And the first words of this Holy Creed, written by St. Athanasius when he was a deacon, which the church puts into our, into our mouths for the season of Pentecost, going therefore, teach ye all nations, whatsoever I have taught you. How important is that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. How important is that? And here are the first words of this creed. And when the Arians, the first, these great heretics of that time, when the Arians read this creed from uh, Athanasius, immediately they said, let us kill him. That was their immediate desire. They were not afraid of the bishops. They were not afraid of, the, of even the Pope. But the deacon Athanasius wrote these words about the sacred truth. The creed that we say in a, a slightly different version of the creed that we say, the Nicene Creed that we have from Nicaea, and that St. Athanasius wrote this creed, and he was and, and he put these words into the into the Holy Creed in the very beginning to make it very clear. <coughs> Whosoever wisheth to be saved, before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Which faith? except every one, do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish eternally. These are the first words. So what follows is probably kind of important. And the Catholic faith is this. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost are, is all one, glory equal, majesty co-eternal, and so on through the entire creed. But what is, what is this holy creed? The priest pulls out his holy bravery today, simple priest. And he's going to read his holy bravery. And he reads these words. We all know the creed is important. Whosoever will be saved, whosoever wishes to be saved, before all things, 
it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. It's also good to stay faithful to your wife. It's also good to not abort your babies. It's also good to be moral. It's also good to, to be modest. It is good to follow the commandments and be able to live a moral life. It is good to say the Holy Rosary. It's good to attend the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass if you're able to attend. It's good to go to confession. It's good to do so many things. But whoever will be saved, whoever is going to go to heaven, whoever is going to see God face to face, before all things, before all these things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith which faith, except every one, every single individual human being on earth, every one, do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt, he shall perish eternally. Now what happened 150 years ago? Doubt entered our holy church. And what happened was that there were theologians who said, you know that we are not sure that of all those outside the church, they shall be damned. We are not sure that all those that believe heresy shall be damned. We're not sure about these things. We are of doubt. We are not sure. Do you have to keep the faith whole and undefiled in order to go to heaven? Now remember there was a thief who lived the most immoral life. And he was most wicked. He even cursed Jesus Christ himself on the day of the crucifixion. But what happened to that thief? St. Saint Augustine says he confessed. That thief confessed the holy faith. St. Dismas. He confessed it before men. He confessed it whole and undefiled. His life was everything but undefiled. His whole life was defiled. He was a wicked man. He lived a wicked life all the way up until Good Friday, about one in the afternoon. He was bad on Good Friday morning. He was bad in the early afternoon. Because when he was hung upon that cross, he also cursed Christ. And when he was on the way to the cross, he cursed Christ. But what happened to him? He accepted the Holy Roman Catholic Church faith, whole and undefiled. And he confessed it before men. And what did he do? He did this before all things else. Hence he said to the other wicked thief, who was also wicked like unto himself, we suffer the just reward of our crimes. But this man has done no wrong. And then he turned to that man upon the central cross, who is God himself. And he said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he believed in the kingdom. And he believed that he was a king. And he believed that he is God. And he believed that he was a second person of the blessed trinity. And he believed the woman at the foot of the cross was the mother of God. And he confessed it. And though he was most defiled before he spoke those words, what happened? St. Augustine tells us what happened. When he spoke those words, sin went out of his body. Sin went out of his heart. Wickedness that was all through his entire being was wiped out by the confession. And he received the holy sacrament of the baptism of desire. And what is this desire? It is a desire of the whole undefiled faith. And whoever desires less, whoever speaks less, whoever communicates less, Whoever is not of this whole faith cannot be saved. What does St. Ignatius and Athanasius say? Without doubt, without doubt, who does, who does not keep this faith whole and undefiled, without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. He shall have everlasting fire. He shall perish everlastingly, not for a brief period of time, but for all eternity. And hence, what is in the heart of the priest? What is in the heart of the bishop? What is in the heart of the bishop of Rome? Who is the Holy Father? There's a new little foolishness going on right now about Pope Benedict saying the bishop of Rome 
it is not that Pope Benedict resigned as Bishop of Rome, but he didn't resign the papacy. And so there's a new thesis being held by this Dr. Maza and others, and you see that so that Pope Francis, Pope Benedict is still the Pope, because Pope, Pope, uh, Pope Benedict resigned Bishop of Rome, but he did not resign the papacy. So he kept the papacy, but he let go of the Bishop of Rome, so that Bishop Pope Francis is truly and validly and rightly the Bishop of Rome, but he is not the successor of Peter. So a new version of St. Vicantism has emerged. Version number 6,483. And so we now have a new version. Now what is this? It is theological and philosophical idiosity. Now, when the bishop of the Pope is the bishop of the See of Rome. Before he was the bishop of the See of Rome, he was the bishop of the See of Antioch. Before he was the bishop of the See of Antioch, he was the bishop of the See of Jerusalem. On Pentecost Sunday, our Lord St. Peter sat upon the chair of the See of Jerusalem, a real city on this earth, which was the head of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Approximately eight years later, he moved to Antioch, where he lived for around 12 years. And in Antioch, he, uh, he made the chair of the Holy See in Antioch, which is a real city on the planet Earth. He then moved to Rome, and there he set the chair of Peter on the city of Rome. In that city, by the command of Jesus Christ himself, he died. Our Lord Jesus Christ told him, Go back to Jerusalem, that is, go back to Rome, for this is the new Jerusalem, and there be crucified. And so he obeyed Jesus Christ. He turned back, and he was crucified in the city of Rome, which then, which then became the city of the chair of Peter. Even when the popes were living in Avignon for 70 years, or however long it was, these popes were called the Bishop of Rome. And in Avignon, there were two bishops. There was the Bishop of Avignon, who was the bishop in charge of the French city of Avignon. And then there was the Bishop of Rome, who resided in Avignon. The head of the Holy Roman Catholic Church is the Bishop of Rome. Now, even if it could be said that the Bishop of Rome can remove the chair from Rome, fine. What does he have to do? We are in a visible church. We are in a church that exists on the real planet Earth. What would Pope Benedict have to do? He would have to remove the chair of Rome and place it in another city, like Boston, Kentucky. That's a nice place. They could have the chair of Boston, Kentucky, or the chair of New York, New York, or the chair of Milan, Italy, or the chair of Albano, which is only a few miles away. Why well, have to go so far away? But the chair will have to be of a real city and on this real planet called Earth. What did Pope Benedict do? He is supposed to have removed the chair of Rome and taken Romanitas, say these wise men, out of the papacy. What did he do? Did he move? Yeah, he did. He moved from 102, which was his original room in the Vatican, to room 103. So now the chair of Rome is the chair of St. Peter is not in room 101, it's in room 102. Where does he live? He lives in the Vatican City. Where does he dwell? In the city of Rome. Where does Pope Francis dwell? He dwells in Vatican City. Where does Pope Francis dwell? He dwells in the city of Rome. So how did Benedict move the sea? He didn't move it. Number one, he cannot move it anyway. But even if you could argue that he could move it, where did he move it? Where did he place this new sea? He didn't place it anywhere. Papacy doesn't float in the sky. And what happens if Bishop, uh, if on the day that Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, uh, Pope Francis and Cardinal Ratzinger die on the same day? Two conclaves happen. One is the successor of St. Peter. One is the successor, rather, of Pope Benedict. The other is the successor of Pope Francis. What happens? Where are they going to be? They're going to both be in the Vatican. They're going to both be in the Rome in the city of Rome. Pope Benedict did not move the sea from Rome to another place. He is living in Rome. And so this, this thesis floating around, and the new version of Sedevicantism, and, uh, you know, because they always got to come up with a new way to slice the, 
the turkey or whatever it is, a new way to skin the cat. The fact is that this is foolishness, absolute theological and philosophical foolishness. And so that they may say, because, uh, because Pope Francis is really and truly the Bishop of Rome, and he was wanted to be the Bishop of Rome, therefore he is not an anti-pope. So that you have the Bishop of Rome, who is not an anti-pope, and you got the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope. And the other Bishop of Rome, he is not the anti-pope. But there can't be two Bishops of Rome. Dr. Maz himself says that. There can't be two Bishops of Rome. Well, what is Benedict the Bishop of? What is Cardinal Ratzinger the bishop of? He did not make himself a bishop of any other city. He is, he, who can, how can he have a successor without having a chair? When the Pope in Avignon died, he died and left vacant the See of Rome. And not only was it a problem that the bishop of, bishop of Rome never went to Rome, when Charles Borromeo was made a bishop, think Charles Borromeo, he was made a bishop of Milan, and he, was, he finally traveled to Milan, and he was the first bishop of Milan to visit Milan for 100 years. Because all of the other bishops of Milan lived in Rome, partied in Rome, and died in Rome. They never visited Milan. They couldn't tell you what Milan looked like. It took over a year after he was consecrated bishop to go to Milan. Says, I've been made the bishop of Milan. I need to go there. You can't go there. You're going to stay in Rome. You're the bishop of Milan. So the fact is that many bishops are outside of their diocese. Many bishops dwell outside their diocese. This happens in, the, in time of persecution, that the bishop may have to dwell outside his diocese, such as St. Athanasius, who had to dwell for many years outside of his diocese. He was a bishop of Alexandria, but he didn't always live in Alexandria. He often lived in other places, but he always remained the bishop of Alexandria. And the Holy Father, the bishop of Rome, is the bishop of Rome. Pope Francis is the Pope. He is the Bishop of Rome. He's just another wicked, evil Pope. That's all. Buy one, get one free. The fact is that there are many wicked bishops in the church. There have been wicked bishops down the last 2,000 years. There will be wicked, wicked bishops until the ending of time. And the Holy Church remains holy. And to find a new version of the error, and a new version of the error, and a new version of the error, what is happening right now is that there are many, many versions all the versions of traditional Catholicism of the last 50 years are now being transplanted into the Vatican II Church. So then you've got Sedevicantis who say the New Mass, Sedevicantis that follow Vatican II. And, now, and then you've got those that, are, that believe that there is a, a new Cardinal Siri. The Siri theory is now the Benny theory. So instead of being Cardinal Siri as the Pope, now it's Benedict Ch 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 Ratzinger is still the Pope. At the age of 93, he'll eventually die. When he dies, then what are you going to do? Who's going to be the new pope? And so there's all kinds of confusion on all levels. What is the answer to this confusion? St. Athanasius gives it in the creed that we read today in the Holy Office of Prime. There is no possibility of salvation. Whosoever will be saved, before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Which faith, except everyone, do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt, he shall perish eternally? What's a simple answer against Sedificantism in all its thousands of versions? It is not found in sacred scripture. It is not found in the teachings of Jesus Christ. And Solomon, by the Holy Ghost, says, There is nothing new under the sun, and therefore it is not of God. There is only one Holy Roman Catholic Church. There is only one Pope at one time, and that Pope is the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome doesn't always live in Rome. However, in this case, we've got the Bishop of Rome, and he's living in Rome anyway. And the Bishop of Rome is the successor of St. Peter. He does not have to be holy. He does not have to be good. He only has to be the elected successor of St. Peter, and he is the representative of God. And furthermore, if he is holy and he is good, his holiness does not make us holy. I may be the holiest priest in the world, the most supernatural priest in the world, without the single vice of being any kind and filled with perfect charity. No matter how perfect I am, I do not have the power to make Jesus Christ present on the altar. I do not have the power to make your sins absolved. However, as a priest of God, with the hands of the power of God put in me by the ordination, 
As long as I wake up long enough for the absolution, you're absolved. <laughs> they used to tell me, one of my preachers, like, Father, wake up. This isn't the confessional. Now, the fact is, I don't wake up long enough, and you're absolved. <laughs> and you're absolved. <laughs> the fact is, that what is necessary for absolution? The divine power that God put into the priesthood. The holiness of the priest does not absolve your sins. And as St. Thomas Aquinas says, most clearly and most simply, as the holiness of the priest does not take away your sins, and as the holiness of the priest does not make you holy, so likewise, if the holiness is removed from the priest, it does not take away your holiness. And if the, and if the holiness is removed from him, and his faith is removed, his virtues are removed, not Christ is not removed. What is the one necessary thing that keeps Christ present? This is the profession of the faith. Therefore, we must be a, there must be a public profession of the faith. And the fact is, now what is happening? The bishops of the church, the real and true bishops of the church, some with good intentions, some with wicked intentions, they are no longer professing the faith whole and undefiled. And what is this doing? It is leading to the damnation of countless souls. What is most necessary? We must believe the faith whole and undefiled. And here is the way that St. Athanasius says it. One must keep the faith whole and undefiled. Very important how he says it. Keep the faith. That is guarded and protected. What is a keep? A keep is an old English word for the most interior part of a castle. In a keep are the most treasured things that we cannot live without. And a man dies before the things in his keep are taken away. Therefore he stands, he allows the outer walls to be taken, he retreats to the inner walls. He allows inner walls to be taken, he finally retreats to the keep, which is a circular, usually a circular tower in the middle of the castle. And in the keep he remains. And if someone tries to take one thing from the keep, he dies rather than loses it. That's what a keep is. Now, what does it mean to keep the faith? Is the faith, whole and undefiled, something that I will never let go of, no matter what? Is the faith something that I will never allow to go out from me? Even if I am promised the moon and promised the treasures of the world, or I am threatened with the greatest tortures, is the faith something that I will not allow to go out of me? If it is that way, it is kept. If it is not that way, it's not in the keep. It's in another part of the castle. Therefore, it cannot be kept. Hence, there are many souls that have the faith in the outer chambers of their brain. And they have the faith in the outer chambers of their, of their castle. They have the faith in the end and borders of their property. And it is contained within their land. But it is not in the keep. It is not in the castle, and therefore they shall not be saved. Hence, therefore, St. Athanasius says, Before all things, it is most necessary that one keep the Catholic faith. This keeping of the Catholic faith involves four necessary truths that must be believed explicitly and all other truths implicitly. And the four necessary truths that must be believed explicitly are that God created the world ex nihilo in the beginning of time. Evolution, impossible. There was no creation over a long period of time, but the creation of the beginning of time by God. Secondly, that God will reward the good and reward the, the evil. He will reward the good with heaven. He will reward the evil with hell. And he will always reward them according to their just deserts. He will not reward them in any evil manner. Those who have deserved heaven, he shall give heaven. Those who have deserved hell, he shall give hell. And then, that God the Son became man and died on the cross for our sins to save us, and we must be washed with his blood to go to heaven and be a member of his mystical body in order to go to heaven. And he is the second person of the Trinity who became man. And hence, all four truths are contained in the fourth truth, which is God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And therefore, in all of our creeds, we always begin with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. We believe in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost are supernatural truths that we must all believe in. We must grab onto these truths. Ignorance does not save us. 
And the last sermon was about invincible ignorance. We won't have the sermon about that this time. But nonetheless, there can the ignorance does not save us. We must embrace the holy truth. Ignorance, all that ignorance does is keep us from being punished because of our ignorance. So that the, in the example we gave in the last sermon, in the Indians of Canada who are lying on the ice, dying of starvation every single year in Canada. The missionaries came, the priests, Jesuit priests came 100 years ago, about 120 years ago, around 1900. And they said, do you realize that if you drill a hole through the ice, there is fish three feet below you. There is food right below you. Now, when those Indians died of starvation every single year, they were not guilty of suicide. They were not punished for suicide. But they were not saved because they did not get the fish. So likewise, when one dies in a state of invincible ignorance, he shall not be punished for anything he doesn't know about because of his invincible ignorance. But he shall not be saved. Because to be ignorant does not save. To be ignorant is dangerous. To be ignorant uh, takes away our own human nature because man is rational. He uses his mind. And his mind must embrace the holy truth. Therefore, missionaries will be driven by a fire. And Catholics will be driven by a fire to go and tell the truth. In the first 300 years of our church, what was the difference of those Catholics and us? Those Catholics realized what St. Athanasius said. Remember Athanasius. He was born... And he lived as a child in the time of the greatest persecution. He was born in 293 AD. When he was 10 years old, he witnessed the most bloody persecution of 300 years. He watched all the priests that he knew die for the faith. He watched his relatives die for the faith. He watched the faith, all of those that had the church that was around him die for the faith. He saw blood shed everywhere for those that died for the faith. And then he became a deacon in our holy church in 325. And he remembered the bloodshed. And he remembered the necessity of our holy faith. And while that, he was a child running around in his teenage years during the greatest persecution of the first 300 years of our church, he was spreading the faith. And God willed that he would not be martyred during that time because it was the will of God that Romans would not try to kill him. Pagans would not try to kill him. Catholics would try to kill him. He would have to flee for his life. He would be persecuted. In the good old days when the Roman soldiers came, I was safe. And now I am with my fellow Catholic bishops and they want to kill me. And now I am with my fellow Catholic faithful and they want to drive me away. And they want to kill me. And I must flee. That's what Athanasius experienced. Because he held the faith whole and undefiled. But he preserved that faith for us. And we must preserve that faith for the next generation. We must carry this faith whole and undefiled from one generation to the next. It is our duty to hold it. And the holiness of the faith does not depend upon the holiness of me. Remember when that thief, Augustine had such a love of that thief. Because that thief was so wicked. That thief was lived such an immoral life. But that thief is now in heaven because he confessed Christ. Because he confessed him before all things else. And therefore he is saved. And so likewise, we must confess Christ. We must confess the holy truth. We cannot play games with the holy truth. We cannot play games with the holy Catholic faith. We can't let it be danced one side or the other. The whole faith of our ancestors must be passed down to us. And we must pass it down to our children and children and children of the third and fourth generation. And we must do as our ancestors did. Be ready to die for our holy faith. God gives a grace to every man, woman, and child to be able to be saved. Those that die before the age of reason, they go to a place called limbo. Who, if they have not been baptized, they go to a place called limbo because of the fact that they are not capable. They did not make a supernatural act. Why do we believe as Catholics in the reality of limbo? Because no man can go to heaven who has not made a supernatural act, which is not possible without supernatural grace. And the babies, though they are innocent of personal sin, they never made a supernatural act. And therefore they cannot see God face to face. They are not in heaven. But they are in a place called limbo, where there is going to be a natural kind of happiness, where they shall not suffer, but they will also never see God face to face. Therefore, the supernatural is most important. We must recognize 
that in our times, the devil is trying to deceive souls. He's trying to deceive them throughout the entire world. He doesn't want the faith to be kept. He doesn't want the faith inside of the keep, in the innermost part of my heart, in the part that I can never let go of. He doesn't want the faith inside of my keep. Those who keep the faith hold on to file. Now, when we keep the faith whole and defiled, it does not mean we don't make mistakes. We often give in the old days the man who had the faith, the great man who had the faith, the old farmer, the old farmer who believed in the four persons in the Blessed Trinity. And the farmer believed in the four persons of the Blessed Trinity because that's what the church teaches, and he believes in it. Of course, he believes that it's a bad example because he believes in three persons of the Blessed Trinity. But nonetheless, he believes in something that the church he believes. This is what the church teaches, and I believe what Christ taught. I believe it whole and undefiled. If he truly believes whatever the church teaches, he keeps the faith. If he doesn't truly believe whatever the church teaches, he does not keep the faith. And so it's possible for him to make a mistake in error, an error in judgment, and make a mistake as to, for instance, say to Vicantus, they are in grave error when they say that Francis is not the Pope. They are in grave error of the Novus Ordo when they say that we must follow the Pope Francis in the Novus Ordo Mass and so on. These are very grave errors. But there are some souls who hold these errors materially, that is, they hold them in their minds, but they don't hold them in their hearts. They don't keep these errors because they want to keep whatever Christ teaches, and they don't fall for the trap of the devil. Even though the devil deceives their mind, he does not succeed in deceiving their hearts, and therefore they keep the faith hold undefiled. There are many other souls who lose that faith. Now the devil corrupts the mind so that he might corrupt the heart. And therefore, it is very important for us to defend our faith, to always protect the mind. It is most important what we believe. What we believe is the most important thing, and all actions follow from that. Without the belief, the actions have no meaning. But belief is the most important thing. And therefore, there is an urgency amongst all Catholics throughout the world. We must go and profess our faith before men. They did it in the first 300 years of persecution. We must do it now. And that this whole faith this faith must be protected, whole and defiled. And the words spoken by Athanasius by the Holy Ghost are divinely true, and they remain true in the year 2020. Whosoever will be saved, before all things, it is necessary that he holds the Catholic faith, which faith, except everyone do keep, whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. We do not wish to perish everlastingly. We wish to live forever with Christ and his Holy Mother, and all the saints. And so therefore, let us hold that faith whole and defiled, and not fall for the deception. For the devil is trying to deceive all. We must not fall for the deception. Stand firm for the faith, and pray for the conversion of sinners, that they all come back to God, and that they, that they come to God, and receive the whole faith, whole and defiled, and die in the state of grace, and be saved. Those are going to bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.